let's settle down now, folks, <laughs> and come into our time of worship. I'm going to invite you to find your, your candle, if you have a Christ candle there with you and something to light it with. And uh, we'll, go, we'll go ahead and turn our hearts and our minds uh, toward God in worship by lighting the Christ candle. And as we light our candles, let us pray, Jesus Christ, light of the world, light our hearts, light our worship spaces, light our church, our town, our county, our state, our nation, our world with the light of your hope, the light of the light of your way, your truth, your life. We pray in your name, the name that is above all names, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen. A prelude this morning, the author of this hymn, which is called Oh, thought she was a Midwesterner. She was born in Illinois in 1841. She died in Iowa in 1897. In 1882, Clara Scott published the Royal Anthem book, the first book of choral anthems ever published by a woman. She wrote this song, Open My Eyes That I May See, in 1895, just two years before she died, tragically, in a buggy accident because of a runaway horse. Every verse in this song prays for greater openness to the Holy Spirit. Open my eyes, open my ears, open my mouth, Open my heart, spirit divine. Again, I welcome you to worship. Those of you who have joined us during that prelude, thank you very much, Francisco, for the beauty of that music. Uh, those of you who are joining us later as you watch the YouTube, uh, we are uh, grateful that you have joined us and that you have joined us in worship at this time. 
Our opening psalm this morning is Psalm 145. And we'll be reading this responsively. I invite you to respond with the bold yellow words. This is a translation from the Iona Abbey worship book. Iona Community in Scotland provides worship resources for us and um, uh, they, they give uh, uh, beautiful translations to the Psalms. And so we've turned to Psalm 40, 145 in their book. Um, the voice of the congregation also will be lifted up by Mary Beth. So you'll read along with Mary Beth Reisner. I bless you every day and praise your name forever. Great are you, O God, and greatly to be praised. Your greatness is beyond all measure. Age to age will praise your works and claim your mighty deeds. I will meditate on your splendor and glory. I will ponder the story of your wonders. People will speak of your awesome power, and I shall tell of all your greatness. They will recall your abundant goodness. Age to age will ring out your justice. You are gracious and compassionate, patient and ever faithful. Your compassion rests on every creature. How good you are to all. Our centering prayer this morning comes from a book called Sound of the Eternal, written by J. Philip Newell. I invite you to consider this beautiful sunrise in the picture. Next to you, that's a Canadian lake sunrise. And uh, join me in this centering prayer. In the silence of the morning, I am alive to the new day's light alert to the early stirrings of the wind and the first sounds of the creatures. In the silence of my heart, I hear the yearnings that are in me and the fears, the hopes that rise from within and the doubts that trouble my soul. In the beginnings of this day, O oh God, before the night's stillness is lost to the day's busyness, open to me the treasure of my inner being, that in the midst of this day's busyness, I may draw on wisdom. Assure me again of my origins in you. Assure me again that my true depths are of you. Amen. Our first scripture reading comes from Jonah, from this reluctant prophet story of Jonah. And we're starting at chapter three. So there's quite a bit of the story that's already been told. I will just give you a very, very quick summary that leads us to this point. You may remember Jonah uh, as this Israelite prophet who did not want to go where God wanted him to go which was to Nineveh and to uh, proclaim a call to repentance to the Ninevites. Jonah didn't want to go there because the Ninevites were Israel's enemies and he really didn't want to see them repent. He really didn't want to see them forgiven. He had a lot of resentment in his heart for these Ninevites and really uh, for some good reason. Anyway, he ran as far as he could away from that call, jumped on a boat going in the opposite direction. A storm came up, they threw him overboard. He was swallowed by a fish, the sp fish spit him out. And he thought, well, maybe I better go where I'm called. He went to Nineveh, he proclaimed fairly weakly because he really didn't have a heart for it, uh, called on the people to repent. And surely enough, they repented. And surely enough, God forgave them. We come into this story in chapter three, uh, and um, Mary Beth, bring us the rest of the story, please. When God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil ways, God changed his mind about the calamity that he had said he would bring upon them, and he did not do it. But this was very displeasing to Jonah, and he became angry. He prayed to the Lord and said, 
oh Lord, is this not what I said while I was still in my own country? That is why I fled to Tarshish at the beginning. For I knew that you are a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and ready to relent from punishing. And now, O oh Lord, please take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. And the Lord said, is it right for you to be angry? Then Jonah went out of the city and sat down east of the city and made a booth for himself there. He sat under it in the shade, waiting to see what would become of the city. The Lord God appointed a bush and made it come up over Jonah to give shade over his head to save him from his discomfort. So Jonah was very happy about the bush. But when dawn came up the next day, God appointed a worm that attacked the bush so that it withered. When the sun rose, God prepared a sultry east wind and the sun beat down on the head of Jonah so that he was faint and asked that he might die. He said, it is better for me to die than to live. But God said to Jonah, is it right for you to be angry about the bush? And he said, yes, angry enough to die. Then the Lord said, you are concerned about the bush for which you did not labor and which you did not grow. It came into being in a night and it perished in a night. And should I not be concerned about Nineveh, that great city in which there are more than 120,000 persons who do not know their right hand from their left and also many animals? Second scripture comes from Matthew verse tw uh, chapter 20, verses 1 through 16. For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. After agreeing with the laborers for the usual daily wage, he sent them into, the, into his vineyard. When he went out about nine o'clock, he saw others standing idle in the marketplace. And he said to them, you also go into the vineyard and I will pay you whatever is right. So they went. When he went out again about noon, at about three o'clock, he did the same. At about five o'clock, he went out and find others standing around and he said to them, why are you standing here idle all day? They said to him, because no one has hired us. He said to them, you also go into the vineyard. When evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to the manager, call the laborers and give them their pay, beginning with the last and then going to the firsts. When those hired about five o'clock came, each of them received the usual daily wage. Now, when the first came, they thought they would receive more, but each of them also received the usual daily wage. And when they received it, they grumbled against the landowner saying, those worked only one hour and you have made them equal to us who have borne the burden of the day in the scorching heats. But he replied to one of them, friend, I am doing you no wrong, but you do not agree with me for the usual wage. That belongs to you and go. I choose to give to this last the same as I give to you. And I am not allowed to do what I choose with what belongs to me, or are you envious because I am generous? So the last will be the first and the first will be the last. 
This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Before we come into this time of confession, I ask you to take a deep breath and consider how you feel hearing these two scriptures. And consider where you feel and for whom you feel. And now we turn to the words again of J. Philip Newell. My genesis is in you, O God. My beginnings are in Eden. My origins are those of every man and woman. Forgive me the falseness of what I have become, the ugliness and divisions of which I am a part. Restore me to the truthfulness of my birth in you, the heritage of all that has being. Renew me this day in the genesis of my soul, the beauty of Eden deep in each created thing. Hear, O Lord, our silent confessions. Friends, hear the good news. What we do, what we think, what we say matters. God hears our complaints and also our prayers. God's love is steadfast and enduring. God's grace is abundant. God's call is ever up, ever forward, ever on toward new and renewed life. Thanks be to God for this word of grace. The peace of Christ be with you. And I will unmute you all so you can pass the peace with each other. Take an opportunity to scroll through, offer the peace of Christ to each other. Peace of Christ be with you all. Peace be with you. Christ be with you. Peace 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 be you. Good morning, family. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, Pat. Hi. Good morning. Good morning. Hi, Luann. Peace be with you, Peace be with you, Bonnie. Hi. Peace be with you, Gary Roberts. Peace be, Peace be with you, you Alan. <laughs> Judy. Peace be with you, Carol. Uh, and John Olney. Peace be with you. And yeah, Katie, too. Peace and be Nevea. with you, Lynn. And Jan. Nevea. Peace be with you. Peace, everybody. Peace be with you. Peace be with you, Pat. Peace be with you. Pat and Harvey. Peace be with you, Peace be with you. Thank you. Peace be with you. Peace be with you. Peace be with you. Peace be with you. Thank you. So I've muted everybody again so we can come into our time of shared prayer requests, but you are able to unmute yourself. Um, if you do wish to speak a prayer request, and I'll, I'll just say that personally, I love it when you do because I love to see your faces when you are offering up prayers and requests for prayers and joys and concerns. Um, you come into the center of my screen, I love to see you. Um, but if you feel more comfortable chatting a prayer request, um, feel, please feel free to chat those as well. And Pat uh, Schmidt has agreed to read those aloud as she sees them chatted into the chat feature. Uh, so at this time, uh, what are the prayers of the people?
Um, we have a prayer request and uh, we have, and a joy. So the joy is that Nevaeh's adoption is Wednesday this week. So we're in um, and the prayer request is one of my friends and colleagues lost her husband um, this past week. He was only 36 years old. Um, and she has two little girls, a three-year-old and a six-year-old, and is obviously devastated. So um, just lots of prayers for her and her, her girls and their family as they mourn and grieve. What was her name? Her name is Lydia Van Valkenberg, and her girls are Peyton and Blake. Is it? I'm so sorry. Yeah. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. <laughs> I'd like to ask for courtesy. I'm going to a new clinic up in Jackson, or I mean up in Ann Arbor, uh, starting with them to see if they can help me with some of the walking and mobility problems. Thank you, Carol Lou. We lift up prayers to you, oh God, for Carol Lou on her walking issues, her difficulty, and her health concerns as she continues to struggle. I just wanted to say thank you for everyone and your prayers and thoughts and concerns. Um, all the new treatments are coming around, and I've been able to walk Buddy lately. I even walked on my treadmill this morning. And I even did work around the house and sprayed the basement and sprayed outside and did all kinds of great things. So it looks like I'm bouncing back. Good. Thanks be to God, Brian. Thank you. I, I would offer prayers of joy that we're um, initiating a small group gatherings in our church and I'm anticipating joyful reconnection with some of you so um, I consider that to be a great joy. Pam and Rick Bunch also are welcoming new granddaughter Vivian Mary Bunch into their family and she is the fourth child of Dan their son and his wife Shannon and it makes their 12th grandchild Awesome. I would just like to ask for continuing prayers for our whole country as some states are seeing actually a rise in, in COVID and prayers that we would have a safe and fair election and just that we would all be loving to each other through the next few months. Lance asked for prayers of healing for his mom. He's not sure what's wrong, but she's clearly not feeling well. So prayers for Lance's mom. What's her name, Lance? Joyce. Joyce Wiseman. Joyce. Please and thank you. Meg Miller asks for prayers for Jonathan, our nephew, who is getting to married tomorrow. Uh, COVID style at uh, Think of Justice of the Peace to Katie Fletcher. Stephanie asks for prayers for the family of Justice Ginsburg and all of us who mourn her loss. Um, I would ask for the prayers of, of a neighbor. Um, I didn't know that he had passed. I was out uh, mowing this weekend and his parents were there cleaning out the uh, apartment next to us. Um, Stephen Schumacher. Um, we talked a few times as I was out, out mowing the lawn and, the parent, and looking at some of his uh, comments uh, uh, from the funeral home. Apparently he was a very... Uh, very loving and good friend of many people. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. And I ask also for prayers, continued prayers for Elaine 
Minx, the joy that Brian shared with a couple of you and me as well is that the test, his biopsy on his, uh, was not malignant, so he does not have cancer, which is good news, and he's delighted with this news. Um, Elaine still struggles with a, a variety of, of health concerns um, uh, and uh, has uh, some additional tests to undergo now um, with an endocrinologist, and so we continue to keep Elaine and prayer. Both of them are gone this weekend. Um, so they've gone separately to spend time with their daughters. So um, with their, because their daughters have issues uh, that, that they wanted some parental support for as well. So we keep the Minx family in our prayers. Yeah, but there's no noise. Kathy? It's Ann. Um, prayers of joy and uh, amazement for my neighbors, who many of you know, John and Michelle Barnhart, who this summer became foster parents, in addition to everything else they do <laughs> in running a funeral home and young children. But they took in a young baby this, who we've watched this whole summer, who's brought joy to them and the whole community. And they just learned last week that an aunt is going to take this child so as they were working through the whole challenge of the love and nurturing and then letting go, a brand new baby came into their lives this last week. Sophia Elizabeth, less than a week old. So as one is transitioning out, a brand new baby came in and all I do is just get tearful for them, amazed that they're taking on this responsibility um, and um, prayers for them, for all they must be going through and the support of the community. I hope they get to do this kind of work. Thank you for that update, Anne. I think about them often and everybody who is working in, in, in uh, the business John is in um, as he works with Handler and funeral homes, uh, funeral directors, and what joy to have life and the laughter and the sounds of life in their house, um, as well as all that he, that he uh, works with at this time, all the grief and loss. And so, Lord, in your mercy and your tender care, we ask for uh, your guidance and your support and strength for the Barnhart family. Thank you. I'd also like to um, ask for prayers for the First Presbyterian Church of Perrysburg. I just got done attending a Zoom worship with them and it was um, Margaret's last Sunday in the pulpit there, and she is moving to Tallahassee, Florida. But now they begin the process of new beginnings, and I just pray that everything goes well for them, as well as for Margaret and her new church in Florida. Thank you, Lance. Yes, we pray traveling mercies for Margaret, and also as the Perrysburg Church begins this search process, we pray uh, their hearts are heavy, I know, because Margaret was so well loved by that congregation. And so as they move into this new chapter, we pray for your divine guidance. Gracious God, we continue to lift to you the prayers that have been spoken and unspoken that rest on our hearts. Prayers for our nation, prayers for our world, prayers through times of transition prayers for your grace and your healing, prayers for reconciliation, prayers for hope. Lord, hear our prayers. I do invite you to continue to chat prayers that you have that, that occur to you during the worship service, um, because everything that, uh, that um, comes across our hearts and our minds and we chat forward will be shared. Uh, in our newsletter on Tuesday so that we can continue to pray for one another. So I want to invite you to chat through the sermon. We've done this before, and if you feel so moved to respond to a question I'm throwing out there, I invite you to chat. I invite you to share with each other, to respond back to me, to think about the things that I'm asking us to think about together and to freely um, comment on them as you feel so moved. I'm gonna turn back again to this parable in the Gospel of Matthew because it is also a story about fairness. And it's a story about justice. Fairness and justice. 
Are they two different things? What are the meanings of those words? Fairness and justice. And who gets to decide what is fair? What is just? Think back again to that story in the Gospel of Matthew. How did it make you feel? How did you feel as you listened to that story? And where did you feel? Did you feel in your heart? Or maybe in your back? <laughs> did you feel in your head? Or maybe in your gut? And who did you feel with in that story? Did you feel with those people who were hired first, who worked all day in the scorching sun with that heavy labor, only to see those who had worked only an hour in the cooler early evening get paid the same? Or did you feel with those who were the ones that came last, who had waited all day to be seen and chosen? Those who had gotten desperate as the hours drew longer, questioning maybe their own worth watching as potential employer after potential employer came, looked past them and chose someone else. Or did you feel with the employers? Thinking about the times you've had to choose somebody to do a short-term job that you have to do or have to have done in your home, how do you choose who will paint your house or work in your landscaping, or build your website, or walk your dog? How do you make those choices as a potential employer? Did you feel for the foreman? <laughs> the, the guy who came in and had to pay the same wages for all of the people, regardless of the time they started, feeling rising tension in the room and wanting to keep the peace. The day laborers rose early that morning, as they did every morning. They said goodbye to their families and they went to work, which for them meant going to a gathering place, a marketplace or a village square and waiting, waiting to be seen, waiting to be chosen, hired, valued, paid for that day, a daily wage for daily bread. To this day, Palestinian laborers still gather, often waiting to be seen, chosen, hired by Israelis to work in the settlements. Middle Eastern scholar Ken Bailey describes what he has seen. As the vans approached, five to 10 young Palestinian men would rush into the street to see how many men the Israeli employer wanted hoping to be selected. I usually looked the other way when I passed, Ken Bailey said, trying not to think about the humiliation those young men suffered and the quiet desperation that their presence reflected. In our country today, according to the National Day Laborer Organizing Network, there are 120,000 men and women who show up day after day to some 700 hiring sites in front of home improvement stores, gas stations, job centers, looking for work one day at a time. Perhaps you've seen some of these people, maybe you've hired some of these people for different jobs in different places you've lived. Now, these are not gig workers. You know gig workers, the gig economy? 
These are not people, although they're also on demand job seekers, gig workers, they're more like our millennials. They use online apps to negotiate their jobs. Things like TaskRabbit, Upwork, Thumbtack, Uber. You've heard of some of these online apps. You know, gig workers make up a third of the US labor market and it's only growing because savvy millennials look for ways to find personal flexibility and autonomy as they work. Well, that's not the 120,000 plus men and women, the plus being those who work independent of the National Day Labor Organizing Network. Those are the, or these are the low tech men and women day laborers. They do it the old fashioned way they gather at collection sites run by people like Jose Hernandez. Earlier this year, a staff writer for the LA Times, Ruben Vives, told Jose's story. Since 2007, Jose Hernandez has been a job coordinator outside a Home Depot in Los Angeles. Back in 2008, with the recession, he remembers competition for jobs to be fierce. And he remembers that laborers, day laborers would rush as potential customers would drive up. And sometimes they would get in fist fights for each other. The fight stopped when Jose organized the workers and got them to agree not to take jobs below minimum wage. Then he built a lottery system using bingo balls for fairness. When the employer would show up for that when the laborer would show up for that day they would take a number and that number would go on a bingo ball and then when an employer a potential employer would come in hernandez started up the bingo balls and whoever bubbled to the top got that job when you're a day laborer you don't know if you're going to get a job that day said hernandez you don't know if you're going to be hired by an honest or unscrupulous employer. You don't know if white supremacists will show up. This is every day. And now, he says, the coronavirus amplifies all these uncertainties to a level we have never seen before. After losing his contracting job because of the pandemic, one of the day laborers whose name is Gabriel Reyes shows up early every morning for a full month at the parking lot of a Home Depot looking for work. He's married, he has three children. He made and carried a cardboard sign saying he was a welder. And in its pockets, he carried little slips of paper with his name and his phone number that he handed out to potential employers. He passed out so many, he lost track. And in that month that he did that, he made 40, 40, 40 dollars. Like so many other day laborers, Reyes has no health insurance, receives no unemployment benefits, has a family to feed. He is desperate, desperate for work day after day. For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner, Jesus says. A landowner who went out early in the morning to hire workers, laborers for his vineyard. An actual landowner surveys his land, his vineyard, to determine how many workers he will need. An actual landowner sends a foreman to the collection point once early in the morning to collect all the people he will need for his work. But see, this is a parable about the kingdom of heaven. So this landowner goes out personally, not once, not twice, five times throughout the day, each time looking across the crowd of gathered people. Still not hired yet? Has anyone seen him or seen him or seen her? I'll take them. Come work for me, 
in my vineyard. Every few hours throughout the day, he checks in. Still here? Come with me. At the beginning of the day, he names the wage, the daily wage, and every other time he collects workers, he simply says, I will pay you what is just. Unbelievably, there are still people there at five o'clock in the evening, still there waiting. They have waited all day long. They have nowhere else to go. They are desperate not to return home to their families without food. All of you, he says, all of you, come with me. And this time he doesn't even promise to pay them anything. And they still are willing to go with him on the fragile hope that they can still make a difference. They can still make an impression. They've been seen, chosen, finally. And that for them is enough in that moment that alone and they're grateful at the end of the day now the foreman's called to pay the wage the daily wage to each laborer in reverse order and those first workers they watch this all unfold with each group before them receiving the same wage including finally themselves, all given the same wage. Wait, what is this? It's exactly what they wanted when they left home that morning. It is exactly what they hoped for. Maybe exactly what they prayed for. Exactly what they agreed to. And yet now, it seems so unfair. You have made them equal to us. When we did all the labor, we worked in the hot sun all day. We carried the full load and they worked only an hour. You have made them equal to us. You have created, have fashioned, have formed them to have the same value as us. Oh, see, Jesus took the words of those laborers and he takes us all the way back to the beginning when the real landowner placed into it the first workers, back to the origin story in the beginning god created humankind in his image in the image of god he created them male and female he created them in the beginning equal partners helpers to tend and care for the garden to work in the vineyard together side by side over the centuries we have created systems of inequality, born of greed, envy, power, fear, control. We have created economic practices that are transactional rather than relational. We have created institutions that afford privilege to some while disadvantaging others. We become so entrenched in these systems and these structures of our own making, so invested in competition and hierarchy and entitlement that it becomes, it feels natural. It feels right. It feels earned, deserved. And then along comes grace and it's offensive. The prophet Jonah is offended that God is merciful to people Jonah considers his enemies, people his, that he believes are undeserving. Yet God loves because they are God's children too, made equally in God's image. 
You remember the elder son in the parable of the returning prodigal. He simmered with anger. How could you throw a party for my wasteful brother by killing a fatted calf for him when I never, I worked all day, every day for you, and I never even got a young goat for my friends. He's offended by such extravagant grace. And then there are these tired, hot, sweaty laborers in the vineyard, whispering angrily under their breath, they only worked an hour. How dare you value them the same? That's not fair. Says who? And why? They expected transactional fairness, a day's wage in exchange for a day's work, payment given in trade for work produced. The landowner offered to pay what was just. Fairness and justice. How are they different? That's not fair, I used to say as a child. <laughs> And my mom would say, you know what my mom would say, life's not fair. But did, what did that really mean? And how did that prepare me for what I would come to learn are deep and profound life depriving injustices in this world in which I live? How did that really prepare me for understanding my role in perpetuating them or in healing them? You made them equal to us. Those first laborers in the vineyard said with anger and resentment, and they spoke the truth, the truth from so long ago in the beginning and the truth of the landowner's practice of present renewal, present remaking through generosity, grace, and compassion, justice for that day, justice for this day, picking up the overlooked, dignifying the desperate, restoring meaning and purpose, providing a place to work, giving a fair and honest daily wage to every laborer, who said yes, who showed up and hung in and were willing to say yes. The reward's the same, no more, no less. Bread sufficient for the day for all who work in the landowner's vineyard. How might this be a model for us? Empowering us to change at least some, some of the unfairness of life that which we can influence, that which we can impact for good. Remember, remember how it was in the beginning. We were each made in God's image, each given our part to play, our equal share, our responsibility for tending the garden, partners, co-laborers. Earlier, we prayed with beautiful words of J. Philip Newell. Listen to them again. My genesis is in you, O oh God. My beginnings are in Eden. My origins are those of every man and woman. Forgive me the falseness of what I have become, the ugliness and divisions of which I am a part. Restore me to the truthfulness of my birth in you, the heritage of all that has being. Renew me this day in the genesis of my soul, the beauty of Eden deep in each created thing. The kingdom of heaven is like a landowner, Jesus said, or a contractor who sees Mr. Reyes with his cardboard sign, desperately handing out his little pieces of paper with his name and his phone number, anxious for his wife and his children at home, praying, please, please pick me. The kingdom of heaven is like a contractor 
who sees Mr. Reyes and chooses him, hires him, values him, never forgetting or forsaking him. Out of great generosity, he made him equal with all of us that the world may even now be made right. May our hearts so also burn with compassion and mercy and justice for every one of God's children. Let it be so, we pray. We have two offerings this morning that we'll remind everybody about. The first is our deacon offering, Brian Myers, our deacon, um, who will talk with us a little bit about this at this time. Good morning, everybody. Um, the garage is still in need of being filled up. You can see on the list, on the right, there's a wish list. Um, I'm pretty much home a lot since I home, work at home. So there's no need to be worried if I will be here or not. Uh, we have signs up all over town and uh, we've been doing PSAs um, to promote the event. It will be social distance in the parking lot. So we're looking forward to a very big crowd, I hope this year. So come on over and drop off a donation or come by on Saturday morning and see all the fun. Thank you, Brian. No problem. And, and we continue uh, with our September offering um, of the denomination, the Peace and Global Witness offering. This will be dedicated on World Communion Sunday, which is the first Sunday in October. Now, this is an offering specifically for peacemaking, um, supporting our peacemakers, acro peacemakers across the world, and also allowing us to reserve 25% of this offering for uh, our own work of local peacemaking. And so if you uh, are so moved, you can give uh, to this global peace and witness offering by sending a check to the church, to Doug Bird's attention, and in the memo line, uh, please say peace and global witness offering so we know where to, uh, to have this um, directed. Uh, this is an important offering uh, for our world at this time. Uh, our, our hymn this morning is going to sound very familiar to last week's hymn because it's the same tune, but there are different words in it for this week. This is um, how some of the hymns in our hymn book are same tunes, familiar tunes with different and new words, depending upon the particular uh, scripture story that it might be um, uh, helpful to pair it with. This one is called For the Fruit of All Creation, and you are invited to sing along. Um, or to read the words and continue to reflect on the message of today. For the fruit of all creation, thanks be to God for his gift. Love and 
May the peace of the Lord Christ go with you wherever he may send you. May he guide you through the wilderness and protect you through the storm. May he bring you home rejoicing at the wonders he has shown you. May he bring you home rejoicing once again into our doors. Our postlude this morning is a hymn called Wonderful Peace. As we stay with the Big Ten this morning, because the author and the composer both are from Wisconsin for this hymn. In 18, they were both together at a camp meeting and the Reverend Cornell, who wrote the words, took a walk down the Milwaukee River. He was so filled with inspiration, he grabbed a piece of paper, an advertisement, flyer that he grabbed the closest thing he could find and he wrote these lyrics on it. And when he returned to the main camp meeting, that piece of paper fell out of his pocket and the Reverend Cooper picked up the paper and he took it over to the organ and he began to compose the melody. And later he added a stanza as well. Peace, peace, wonderful peace, coming down from the Father above, sweep over my spirit forever, I pray, in fathomless billows of love. Thank you for that beautiful gift of music. I've now opened the fellowship rooms and if you see an invitation on your screen to go to a room, you can go ahead and say yes and join and I'll bring you back in about 10 minutes. Have a good week, everybody. Yeah, have a good week. If you haven't yet blown out your Christ candle, we'll- Don't forget, yeah. Yeah, uh, the, don't forget to blow it out because yeah. I don't want your houses to go up in flames, but we'll- We'll uh, uh, sort of officially end our worship time together and peace be with you all.
as you enjoy this beautiful day. We have a couple of warm days coming up. Peace be with you. Keep praying for each other. Love.